Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1868. This week we are celebrating the 70th annual Pebble Beach Concord Elegance that takes place Sunday, August 15th at the Lodge in Pebble Beach, California. To learn more and get your tickets, go to pebblebeach.net. This will be a year to not be missed. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today I'm in Geimenbach. If I'm saying that right, Germany near the Black Forest or in the Black Forest with a very special guest by the name of Julius Kruta. Julius, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have any gear and are you ready to release the clutch? I am ready to release the clutch. I'm very proud to be on show with you tonight. Well, well, thank you. Uh, We'll have some fun here. And we're going to be talking about Pebble, but we're also going to talk about an incredible history that you have with Bugatti, a very special mark. And I ask all my guests this question when we begin. Before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing that most people may not know about you, Julius? Well... I hope there are many things people don't know about me. (laughs) Good answer. (laughs) But actually, most people don't know that my car career actually started with model cars. Ah. I became heavily influenced by, well, let's say by the vintage automotive bug in the early 1980s when I was a very young exchange student in the UK. The family I lived with, they took me to Prescott. And that was such a romantic place uh, that even as a 12, 13-year-old at the time, I could tell that a place like that doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet. Just re- imagine a hill climb. The setting is the early 1980s, but nothing has really changed since the late 1920s, early 1930s. And Bugatti's thunder up the hill, other vintage cars as well. It's sunny and it's dry. It's the Cotswolds. Uh, It's England at its best. And I have to say, I simply fell in love with the Bugatti brand that very day. I already knew about it, but I didn't realize that really the British were flying the flag or had been flying the flag of this dormant brand for so many years. And a couple of years later, I started to, um, uh, to get in touch with a doctor in Frankfurt, Germany, who um, I started a company building hand-built resin Bugatti model cars. Oh, wow. We were quite successful, but uh, we never earned any money. We sold to the U.S., we sold to Japan. Mm -hmm. Uh, We had quite good, quite very high detailed models. But as I said, it didn't really make money and I had to finish my studies. So all that stopped about 20 years ago. And not many people know that. Wow, fascinating. I, I, well, I love it. I built many models as a kid, probably not anywhere near the level of what you were doing, but I still have probably too many around the house. At least my wife <laughs> reminds, reminds me of that from time to time, but uh, yeah, that's always the I'm case. in charge of dusting those, not her. Let me give you a proper introduction, and we're going to dive into your life with Bugatti and the, the things that you do for this wonderful event that's coming up. Thankfully, we're back on the lawn. So, Julius Kruta is a freelance historian and automotive advisor. He has been a judge at major concours in Europe and the United States and is on the selection committee at the Pebble Beach Concours d'Elegance. While still at university, he started working as a consultant for Volkswagen AG in 1999 after the group's acquisition of the Bugatti brand. After having graduated from university with his thesis on Bugatti, That's pretty cool. He started his career in 2000 at Bugatti Automobiles in the marketing department. In 2003, he'd become head of tradition of Bugatti Automobiles. Now there's a kid's dream come true. Julius held this position until the summer of 2018. He is co-authored, or is a co-author, I should say, of six publications on the mark, the latest being Bugatti Type 50 Le Mans, together with Mark Morris, published by my friends, at Porter Press. We'll be back in just a minute to learn more about Julius Bugatti and the Pebble Beach Concord, but first a word from our valued sponsors. So keep the seatbelts on. We'll be right back. Are you ready to get out and hit the road? Boy, I sure am. This country has so much to offer, and what better way than to get out and drive? Covercraft protects the things that move you. From protective covers for the outside of your vehicles to the inside with dash covers, seat covers, 
and sunscreens, all creatively designed to keep your vehicle cool for those roadside stops for a meal or to take in the view. Covercraft custom tailors their designs for your special vehicles and manufactures with the quality and attention to detail that's been their standard since 1965. Road trips can be hard on your vehicle surfaces, so protect them. And when you get home, cleanup is fast and easy. And you want to get a deal? Well, I've got one just for you. Use the code YA21 at Covercraft.com and you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order. That's right, 10% off compliments of cars, yeah. Simply use the code YEAH21, YA21, at checkout. I've been protecting my vehicles with Covercraft covers since 1975. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you. Go to Covercraft.com today. I was tired of my rates for my collector car insurance going up every year for no explainable reason. My carrier seemed to be turning into a media company versus an insurance company. And I realized that a portion of my policy premium was paying for all those so-called free media goodies. So I did my homework. I talked to knowledgeable collectors, shopped around and discovered American Collectors Insurance. They've been serving the collector car hobby since 1976. You last that long by properly serving your customers' insurance need, not with a lot of fluff. ACI is ranked the number one online collector car insurance provider, according to Google, Trustpilot, Facebook, and they offer their real person guarantee live support. No never-ending phone loops when you need help. Plus, because you don't use your classic car as a daily driver, you could save up to 40% compared to regular auto insurance. American Collectors Insurance provides agreed value policies. So if you experience a total loss to your collector vehicle or it's stolen, you'll be paid the amount listed on your declaration page, less any deductibles, of course. No ifs, ands, or buts. Give them a call today and ask for your free quote at 866-ACI-YEAH. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine, Mark Greens, at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance, classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. All right, Julius, we are back. So I want to dive a little deeper into the corner. And I want to start with you sharing a little bit about your time at Bugatti. And then we're going to get into the Pebble Beach Concours. This is really a kid's dream come true from your introduction to the story you told us that most people don't know about your models. And you get to play with this mark and work in this mark. Oh, my gosh, what a life you've had, my friend. That is actually quite true. I would like to start this with a phrase that the president of the Italian Bugatti Club once said many, many moons ago, Francesco Guasti said, Julius, with his rich Italian accent, Julius is a getting a paid for having a fan. <laughs> and actually, he wasn't that far off. You know, in the very beginning, I was the first employee in, um, in Malta. Apart from me, there was only the gardener and the housekeeper. Wow. And... Um, yeah, I, I played golf with the mayors of the villages, uh, Dorlisheim and Maltzheim, in order to be able to buy the ground next to the Chateau Saint-Jean, where I had my office, uh, where the factory was built a couple of years later. I did literally everything. It wasn't, well, I was never used to corporate life. And I have to be very careful here. I left at the right moment. The corporate life in Bugatti became more and more. The beginning of Bugatti's story in Maltzheim in the year 2001, 2002 was very romantic. And we had a number of fantastic presidents. Um, But it all became more engulfed by the Volkswagen Group. And you've got marketing people who, um, who are probably also car enthusiasts. But they are not as much as car enthusiasts as you and I are. Mm. Let me put it this way. Yes. <laughs> but no, I was, I was doing the craziest things on the planet. I was driving a Bugatti Type 35 uh, around China. I was doing the Mille Miglia with journalists. Um, I, I went to Pebble Beach every year, which is obviously one of the highlights. And yeah, by the way, Sandra is having her 36th year at Pebble this year. Incredible, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly speaking, when did she start? 
was she 15 or 20? <laughs> I, I don't know. But honestly speaking, Sandra is just unbelievable. Um, what she has done over the last couple of years, this Concord is her baby uh, to a great extent. And the former president of Pebble Beach once said, Julius, remember where you saw it first. What he meant was whenever a great car comes out of the woods freshly restored or preserved and is on the lawn at Pebble, there's no other concours where cars are restored, especially for that event. There's no other concours. Right. You always see a car first at Pebble. And obviously, in the 1970s, Pebble was important. In the 1980s, it became more important. I really think Pebble became the queen of all the concours in the mid to late 1990s. And that is obviously the time when Sandra came in. So yes, unbelievable work by her. Ah, bravo, bravo. Well, let's dive into the Concours and talk a little bit about your involvement. Now, being a Bugatti expert on the mark, obviously, you've lived at that mark your whole life. I understand you also have great knowledge of Mercedes-Benz. Let's talk a little bit about your role on the selection committee, what that involves, how on earth you guys pare down what Sandra told me on Monday, sometimes a thousand plus people wanting to be on the lawn and how you how you get through that, I have no idea. Let's talk about that. Yeah, that's a very good point. I've been on the selection committee for more than 10 years now, um, since Sandra started it. And uh, together with a Danish guy, Peter Larsen, I'm the only European-based person who is on the selection committee, and so obviously the only German. For Peter and me, um, going to Pebble every March, well, obviously we didn't go this year, and we didn't, sadly, sadly, that last year we saw, the last time we saw Sandra was in March 2020. And um, she had that incredible foresight and said, I, I doubt whether we will see Pebble this year. Well, anyway, this is just a sidekick. She was so, yeah, she was right. But um, we've been always sitting together in the selection committee for three days. And in the beginning, we had, as you said, some 700 to 1,000 cars. But there are a number of cars which obviously will never make it on the field. So you start to really look for the cars which have a chance. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, some 10, 12, 13 years back, we were even discussing nothing wrong with a Ferrari Mondial, but we were even discussing a Mondial. And then the whole um, selection committee process <laughs> took more than three days, as you can imagine. Yes. And so nowadays, if um, if Michaela gets a Ferrari Mondial uh, from 1984 or 85, she automatically kindly refute, declines the car and says, it's not possible to go on the lawn. But when you're coming down to something like three, 400 cars, uh, life is even more difficult because you have to find the balance. You have to build the classes. Sometimes you have to build a class around a car, which is extremely prominent or, or very, very important. And sometimes you realize that a, that a class actually um, establishes itself because you have enough cars of a class and then you try to find cars that would fit the class. And we have to be extremely careful, obviously, because... People, as I said earlier on, they want to get into Pebble because Pebble is the queen of all concours. And so original, originality and provenance are the most important things that we have to take into consideration. And obviously style and um, everything that goes around a vintage car that makes you tick, that makes you in your head tick all the boxes and say, yes, that car should be on the field. And then we have to pay attention. Is it ready to be, is it, is it finished? We've had cars dropping out because they were not ready. Mm -hmm. They weren't finished, mm -hmm. you see. Yeah. So it's a very, very long process. Sorry, Mark, if I'm going too deep here. I understand you guys begin this process years in advance. It isn't like August 30th hitch and you go, okay, let's start planning for next year. I understand this is a long, long process. And of course, regular regular listeners here will know Peter Larson's been a guest twice here on Cars Yeah to talk about his incredible books and his in-depth knowledge of specific marks and so forth. How in your mind will the field be different and unique this 70th anniversary of this wonderful event? Well, this is a very easy uh, answer to give you because the 70th anniversary has 
I mean, there are fantastic classes like the Lamborghini Countach class. I mean, to see a Countach is not that special, but to see 10, 12 different Countaches in different colors from different years is something outstanding. But thinking about a 917 class. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Having 10, 12 from a 917 short tail, a car for quartz, or um, a 917 stroke 30, we will have in Pebble Beach this year an amazing class of 917s. And this is also something which is very special about Pebble. Where else on the planet could you get a class together of 250 GTOs of Jaguar D-types of 917 Porsches, nowhere else but Pebble. Nowhere. Only Pebble is yeah. important enough for the owners to say, yes, I will bring it. Because it is also important for the history of their car if it is invited to Pebble. Because Sandra also said it in the past, if you're invited or if you're accepted, you don't have to win the class. You're already a winner being on the field. Yes. And that is actually quite true. Because you're asking me about about the selection, uh, selecting process, mm -hmm. what we have to pay attention, and I would like to add that, obviously, is that many cars are, are foisted on us. So many cars, sometimes cars come out of the blue and they haven't been seen for 30, 40, 50 years. And then sometimes all the alarm glock ring because we have to investigate and we have to really make sure that we do not have fakes on the lawn. Mm. Yes, uh, I, I just uh, so many moving pieces to this thing. And we talk about Sandra being the orchestra master here, uh, you know, with her baton and how you keep all this straight. But it's because of experts like you and the guests I've had this week on the show have been absolutely uh, incredible group of people. One thing that I know that's going to happen this year, which is very cool, are 40 past winners are going to be lined up against the water there. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the person who wins best best of class this year, best in show, I should say, and gets to park next to that lineup of cars, that is going to be one special occasion. Absolutely. And uh, funny that you're mentioning the best of show winners, and they will be most likely alongside the waterfront. And the last time Sandra had the best of show winners was in the year 2000, when it was 50 years of Pebble Beach. Mm -hmm. And that was my first Pebble Beach. Oh, okay. And it, it was unbelievable. And this time, and as you mentioned, I'm a bit of a Bugatti nut, um, <laughs> we will have two Type 57 SC Atlantic on oh, the field. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, this happened in 2003 for the Bugatti year, but um, to see an Atlantic at a show is pretty, pretty rare. But to have two together, this is pretty much unheard of. Again, only at Pebble. I think they're going to be, is that Peter Mullen's vehicle and uh, Ralph Lorenz? Yes, correct. Yeah. It takes your breath away just, just thinking about it. W will there be some other special Bugattis on the lawn this year? Yeah, there is um, Jim Patterson's 57 SC Atalant, which won in 1976 when it was still owned by um, the Harrow Collection, which has been re-restored in the meantime. And, uh, well, there are some other past winners, obviously. Uh, Bugatti, you have to remember, is, as um, Candace just emailed me a couple of days back, the winniest brand at Pebble Beach, mm. having nine overall wins. Uh, I think the second mm, biggest number in wins is Mercedes. But um, it shows you quite something that Bugatti has more wins than anybody else. Wow. I didn't know that. Nine wins. Nine wins. Wow. Well, that makes sense. Uh, such a special mark. Uh, absolutely spectacular mark. And it just continues to this day. I mean, even the modern cars today, which are nothing like the old cars, of course, but they're all very special. Seems like every one of them is a very, very special. They are. What else has got you very excited about Pebble this year? Other cars that you know are coming? Well, let me answer this in a different way. Because... I know the cars which are coming because I'm part of the selection committee and I have access and I see the cars before they're coming with pictures mm -hmm. in our shared on our shared drive for the judges and the selection committee members. And the most amazing thing usually is, you know, the car is coming, you pretty much every single one of them appears. It's very rare that the car doesn't appear, but actually the impact to see them 
on the Sunday morning, arriving on the field from something like five, six o'clock onwards when we are all there, because this is the best time to see the cars oh, yeah. when they drive on the field. They always give out these hats and everybody wants these Dawn Patrol hats. Oh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, and you get coffee and the sun is coming up and you see these cars driving on the field and you think, this is unbelievable because Pebble is the rare case where the reality is greater than what you see in the pictures. <laughs> and yeah. that really, if you say, if you ask me what class I like best, it is the composition. It is the whole harmonic symphony, which then is on the field, 200, 220 cars, and every single one of them deserves to be on the field. And every single one of them is pretty outstanding. Yeah. And actually, it's, it, it's like this old phrase, a child in a toy shop. Uh, or a child in a kidney store. In a, I'm sorry, not in a kidney. A child <laughs> in, a, in a candy store, candy. not in a kidney store. Yeah, that would be a little um, odd, wouldn't it? <laughs> that, yeah, exactly. A, ca- a child in a candy store. But it, it, you cannot digest it all. It overwhelms you. It's like a flash. Yes. And that makes it special to me. That Sunday morning when you see them all coming and when you see them all parked up and when you hear, hear the different engines Cars coming, careful, cars coming through, cars coming through. It's magic. It is. It's uh, just incredible. 30 years I've been able to do this. Ah, <laughs> it takes my breath away just listening to you say it. Yeah, just the memories are wonderful. We're going to take a short break. We come back. I want to talk about a, a bit about a challenge uh, in a couple aspects here because certainly we were challenged last year and we continue to be in many ways and you in Europe as well. So keep that thought and we'll be right back. What began as a charitable car show has grown into the world's greatest collector car auctions, raising over $133 million for charitable organizations to date. For nearly 50 years, automotive enthusiasts from all over the world have enjoyed the Barrett-Jackson Collector Car Auctions, and I'm a huge fan. Regarded as the barometer of the collector car industry, their auctions are world-class lifestyle events, where thousands of the world's most sought-after unique and valuable automobiles cross the block in front of a global audience, in person, on TV, or streamed online. Barrett-Jackson produces the world's greatest collector car auctions in Scottsdale, Arizona, Palm Beach, Florida, Las Vegas, Nevada, and new for 2021, Houston, Texas. The excitement of Barrett-Jackson auctions is contagious, and a unique experience is not to be missed. And be sure to visit BarrettJackson.com today. Barrett Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auctions. So, Julius, let's talk about challenges. I want to first talk about, and you touched on some of this, in the judging process, there are many challenges, of course. But what would you say is the biggest challenge when you're trying to curate a show at this level? Well, the biggest challenge is to be fair to every owner and to give the same attention to every car in a class so that everybody feels not treated the wrong way or actually judged or his car being judged or not not valued enough is probably the right word. I I understand, yeah. It's probably very important that the judges have the right field manners and treat the owner of a potential best of show and judge a potential best of show in the same way as a car where they can already tell because they're experts and do their homework, where they know it's highly unlikely that this car makes it into the winner's circle or into the class winners. And I think that is very important to treat everybody the same way and to give and to give everybody the same the same time. I love it. It's important. Yeah, and like you said earlier, just being on the lawn, you're already a winner. You're already a winner. Yeah, yeah you are. You really are. <laughs> you know, last year, of course, we didn't have an event. We didn't have a lot of events. And the uh, tragedy that is COVID and the pandemic that hit us all, uh, while things are beginning to open up, it's still challenging a lot of people with this event, you being one of them, being in Europe just because of travel restrictions and getting back and so forth. How has this affected you in the process of curating the event, selecting cars, but also getting here? Well, 
three quick short answers. Because there was no Pebble Beach Concours in 2020, we had the selection committee in San Diego in 2020 in March. So we more or less did our homework back then. But we had a very long Zoom conference um, earlier this year. So that was probably the biggest Zoom conference I ever had with 17 or 18 people all together in the Zoom conference. And the third thing is I am personally affected because at the moment, I uh, it doesn't look like as if I will make it to Pebble this year. Although I've tried everything with the embassy in Frankfurt, in Germany, I've handed in this, this NIE letter, which is signed by Sandra, um, in order to make an exemption for me going over. But at the moment, I haven't got a response. I haven't got a decline, nor, nor do I have an OK. Mm -hmm. So I actually, I'm really hoping to get an OK. But um, normally, I'd be flying in, uh, in uh, 14 days' time. I'd be flying on the 11th. And at the moment, it doesn't, sadly, it doesn't look like me going. Um, I will hope there will be some, some live broadcasting from the event. Um, I'd have to get up really, really early. <laughs> yes. But um, I, I can tell you I will cry because um, I've been to every Pebble Beach since the year 2000, and uh, I would hate to miss it. I would hate. This has affected more people, everybody, really, in so many ways, and it just continues to create havoc and challenges for us all. But we're healthy. We're here, and that's a blessing. So we, yeah, we, won't, right. we won't complain greatly about it, but definitely is a challenge. I want to talk about a special vehicle in your life, which has got to be an incredibly hard question to answer. Maybe not, but you've been surrounded by so many, but maybe this is a vehicle you've owned or maybe it's the first vehicle you had, or it's a vehicle you got to participate in something like the Mille Emilia, which is pretty darn incredible. So what is that one special vehicle in your life, Julius? Well, it's funny enough, rather easy to answer for me. The first president of Bugatti Automobiles back in 2003 asked me to buy a vintage car uh, for the Volkswagen Group, and um, I bought a Type 35 for the Volkswagen Group for Bugatti, which I drove, I would say, probably, most likely, more than 20,000 miles. What? Yeah, Oh, easily. my gosh. Whoa. I, I, um, I used the Type 35 with journalists in several millimillias. I um, had the car in Pebble Beach um, as more or less my, my runabout. <laughs> Your runabout. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I've been to the International Bugatti Rally in Japan with it. I've been to one of the very, very first automotive historic rallies in China. And I did a two-week round trip in 2014 in China where um, we were driving for about 80 miles on a, servant ro on a service road for windcraft for a big windcraft farm it was unbelievable there was no other cars apart from us because we were on this service road and there were these there was this windcraft farm which was these big windcraft things up until the horizon um no this this type 35 is a joy to drive it's an absolute jewel it is um, it is hand it is the best pre-war car that I know of, um, considering gearbox and handling. It's not the fastest. It's not the fastest at accelerating, but it's the most fun to drive of all the pre-war cars I have ever driven. And as I said, has the best steering, best handling, best throttle response, and by far the best gearbox. I would use this Type 35 to go from here to the south of France now, no problem at all. <laughs> they are extremely reliable when they are well prepared. You know how fortunate you are, right? Holy cow. I, mean, I know that. I realize that. <laughs> There's a great photo I remember seeing, I believe it was on motor1.com, of when the Bugatti Devo is parked next to that vehicle. Yeah, it is actually that car that I used for so many years. Yeah, it's a, an incredible photo when you look at the two vehicles and you think about a relatively short period of time when you think about time of course between those two cars and where we've come and where Bugatti came from and where it is today uh, the heritage remains intact now I'm going to crawl into your head a little bit now I know this can be a weird question for some people but bear with me if you were transpired into a vehicle you know you became a vehicle manifest as a vehicle what would Julius Kruta be? But more importantly, why? Yeah, well, that is a question I've been thinking about for quite some time now, <laughs> since I read your question. And um, 
I have to say, um, it would probably be, it would probably be a Type Thirty Five mm-hmm. because it's not the fastest. It's not very modern, but it is quite reliable in certain ways, mm. and um, it is something that is out of the ordinary. It's not something that you see every day, and um, you know. I think I would definitely be a pre-war car, whether I'd be a Bugatti, I don't know. But I'm pretty much old-fashioned. I still read papers, not online, but actually as a piece of paper. I still use a phone which has a landline, all these odd things that young people don't really know about. (laughs) Yeah. I still write letters. So I'd definitely be a pre-war car. If I am a 35, I don't know. (laughs) Certainly not as fast as a type 35, but, um, (laughs) but I would feel most at home being a type 35. Well, I'm I'm glad you answered that the way that you did, Julius, because when Sandra and Candace suggested that we talk here on Cars, yeah, they said, you're going to find Julius be a very unique individual, very old world, get new world. And there you go. (laughs) So, uh, uh, yeah, you came with high accolades, my friend. So uh, I like that answer. And I think for someone like you who've spent their entire life from that moment you saw that first car as a child, in the world of Bugatti, you can't be anything else. I mean, that's you. It's in your blood. It's, it's quite funny, you know. As you know, I'm um, I'm a, a German citizen, and I was born in Germany. But I I tend to like French, English, and Italian cars. There are very few German cars that really make my heart race uh, because you know the fascination the fascination of german cars is mainly their reliability you know why 300 sl roadsters and gull wings are so sought after i personally and i don't want to hurt anybody's feelings but i personally believe because they are so easy to drive and always start you see um, <laughs> yes <laughs> that, they are fun but you know they are just a mercedes you know and we have this terrible saying in Germany, if I want to drive a Mercedes, I get into a taxi, you see. Oh, yes. So um, I have this sweet spot for these romantic brands mm. on the planet. And uh, the romantic bland- brands come from the mer- romantic countries. And uh, they are Italian and, and, and French, obviously. Yep. And British, too. Uh, wonderful. And, and more romantic than probably German. But um, funny enough, there are some romantic German cars, believe it or not. And they are very un-German. And um, I don't know whether you've ever heard of a car called the BMW Z1. Oh, yes. You have? Yes. With the sliding down doors? Yeah, door goes down, hit, yeah, underneath, yeah. It's very un-German. Yeah, yeah yes. Because, <laughs> because it's la pour la. It's, it doesn't have a real reason. And Germans do nothing without a reason. Mm. So this car is to me one of the most stunning german cars because it it combines a romantic spirit uh, with a very refined and engineered car mm-hmm. but I'm, I'm i'm telling you this because i want to get to the point why why we love cars and mm-hmm. why cars have a different meaning for everybody because it all comes also from our mentality what we like what we feel for. And that's why coming back to your original question about Pebble, going on the lawn on the Sunday morning when the sun is not yet up, you see so many mentalities of cars and people. And that's what brings us all together. And that is what I think is so important. That is the quintessence. It is. And I've heard that over and over. Uh, The cars are the catalyst that bring us all together. Uh, I've said this many times on this show. I see people on the lawn at Pebble I've literally not spoken to or seen for a year. And there's an instant bond, a hug, hello. (laughs) I mean, it's just like, you know, hey, we're here again. This is great. Smiles, laugh. It's just incredible. Yeah, just incredible. So uh, It's it's quite funny. There are some people that you've known for 20 years and Mm -hmm. you don't know their name. And (laughs) you don't know their name. You've seen them for 20 years, probably 30 years. And um, you see them in Arizona for the um, auction week in January. Mm -hmm. You see them at Retromobile. You see them um, at Pebble again, but you don't know them. But you start to say hello to them because they know you and you know them. 
but you've never really spoken to them. <laughs> but you're yeah. part of a family. Yeah, it's quite fun. It is very true. And I years ago I started doing that, and I do talk to a lot of people. And that's what I'm known for. So I just started walking up, going, "You don't know me, and I don't know you, but I know you. Who are you?" <laughs> and- exactly. Exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. An instant bond is created. Now, you mentioned writing, and I, I introduced you talking about your newest book, uh, which is Bugatti. You say it much better than I do. Bugatti, Type 50 Le Mans by my friends at Porter Press. I always ask my guests to recommend a book. Now, you've written quite a few books uh, on the brand. I believe one, two, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, now six books. Do I have my numbers right? Yeah, probably. Wow, probably. Probably. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about this new book. It came out, I think, um, came out January. It came out Retromobile 2019. Mm-hmm. And it is one of the great car series of Porter Press where we deal with one single car, the history of this car. And the series is about individual cars, which is actually quite challenging in the beginning when you think you have to fill 308 pages on on one one car, on one chassis number, not Mm -hmm. on one type. I mean, there are many books on one kind of, on one type of car, which have less pages. And actually, Mark Morris and I got into this car. We had a lot of information and um, thank God we had a lot of research um, stuff helped by the owner who handed us literally a, two big boxes of stuff. And we were fortunate because there was an American owner who had the car for many, many years called Miles Coverdale. And he was ahead of the game in many ways of preserving cars than most people at the time and even still today. He understood cars as they have to be preserved and shouldn't be restored. We are now even having a preserved car class at Pebble Beach, and Mm -hmm. several now, even having now an electric class at Pebble. So you can see how much forward thinking there is at Pebble. But um, this Type 50 was never molested, never restored, and that is something which you cannot repeat. You can never repeat originality. Sometimes right. people go too far. And I sometimes say to people, well, um, you leave a dent in the, in the door. Well, if somebody, if somebody has an accident with a car and drives into your house, do you leave the wall uh, uh, yeah. destroyed as well? Right. And oh, you, your house in France, your chateau is from 1857. So you're not having electric light in there. You're having candles. Mm. So you know what I mean. Uh, things yes. can go too far. Yes. But the advantage we had with this car is it was clean. It was sober. It was not neglected. It had always been cared for. And that's where we were able to relatively easy tell the story of this car. And we found a lot of pictures at LATs and other archives in Europe. And um, the book was a pretty straightforward thing because we also dealt with the time. We, We were trying to involve the reader into the time and we had a first chapter which was um called the world in 1931 so you learn about the chrysler building you learn about who won the um the boat race between cambridge and oxford you know you learn what happened in 1931 and i think that's always a great perspective to talk not only about the car but also about the history of of the time when the car was built. I love it. Well, my friends at Porter Press have sent many great authors here, and I'll make sure I put links to all of Julius's books. You can go to the Porter Press website <laughs> and, and, and see all these because uh, I've got several of them. They're really fantastic, and the, the in-depthness they go to, and I love that historical uh, starting point as well. So important when you think about old vehicles. I want to take you on the ultimate drive here. Now, you've been on so many ultimate drives. I'm not sure how you're going to answer this one, but I have a magic scepter, which means you you can pick any vehicle, any person, living or deceased, and anywhere you want to be. So what does that ultimate drive look like for you, Julius? Well, the ultimate drive would be <laughs> the ultimate drive would be probably leaving Bordeaux and driving through the Perigord, uh, driving along the not exactly on the coastline in the south of France, but driving through the uncrowded roads of the Provence into Switzerland, doing some alpine passes and um, coming out at Villa d'Este at Lake Como. Mm. That would be something. And you're not having a single 
mile of motorway. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that is very important. And you're only using old chateaus as hotels. You, you, your accommodation has to be always a, a chateau which matches your car <laughs> so that you don't get eye cancer, as I say, if you're... <laughs> The problem I always have with some of these rallies is when they find very beautiful roads, but then they put you in a hotel, which is rather modern and part of a big chain. Mm -hmm. And that's not the experience I like, you see. I'd like to be with, when you're driving an old car, a vintage car, or classic or modern classic, you want to enjoy everything around it. The okay. landscape, the roads, the drive, but also the hotels and food. And what's the car you'd be in? Mm. <laughs> well, that's secondary. Mm. Let's go for an Alpha 8C23 long tail oh, touring. <laughs> okay, that sounds wonderful, spectacular. And lastly, who would you be with? Who would I be with? Yeah, I, that's a fantastic idea. Um, I would probably want to speak to Mr. Bugatti and see what he thinks of Vittorio Llano's creations mm -hmm. and um, ask him all these questions that nobody has asked him and find out more about him yeah, be because wonderful. there's still so many answered un, uh, questions unanswered. That would be pretty spectacular. Well, once again, you've drifted me off into a wonderful fantasy tale here, my friend. <laughs> that just sounds absolutely <laughs> well, with your help. <laughs> well, with thank your you. Help. Maybe we'll do that ride together someday. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, why not? Why not? Why not? You have taken us on a wonderful ride today, Julius, and I want to thank you for your time. Uh, before I let you go, would you offer us maybe a parting success quote, mantra, some kind of words of wisdom? Well, I wouldn't really have any words of wisdom, but many people have said that in the past. Don't get advised by too many advisors when you think about classic cars. Enjoy them with your friends and buy what you like, not what others tell you to like. Mm. But that is nothing new, I would say. Um, well, the other phrase, which is sadly nothing that I will tell you which is new, always buy the best um, you can afford because it will be the cheapest, but that's something you've heard for before because you can enjoy it immediately or buy a total rack where you can really enjoy doing it, doing it the way it should be done, but yeah. nothing in between. Either buy the total rack or buy the best. Don't buy the mediocre stuff. Yeah, Bruce Meyer, uh, you know, collector extraordinaire, a quintessential car guy out of Los Angeles said, uh, you'll never regret overpaying for the right car. That's correct. And uh, he never overpaid. And um, he always paid top dollar. Yep. Bruce has uh, a very acquired taste. And yes. um, I love all his cars. Very, very special stuff he owns. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Absolutely. Listeners, you can find everything on Julie's show notes page. Uh, if you're fortunate enough to attend the Pebble Beach Concord this year, or if you've attended in the past, you know what we're talking about. But if you haven't, you have to go. This is an event not to be missed. Be Julius, missed. hey, thank you for being so generous today with your time and your expertise. I hope you make it across the pond, as they say. And thank <laughs> you for sharing your experiences with us. If not, we'll see you in 2022. Until you and well, I talk so. again, <laughs> yes, until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you down the road. Thank you very much indeed, Mark. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. You're welcome. This was wonderful. I've discovered Linkage. It's a new quarterly publication and website that covers the automotive market, driving, restoring, collecting, and discovering your passion for motor vehicles. Linkage is about experiences, opinions, and values. Linkage is an actual informed, reasoned opinion based on firsthand experiences. A talented Linkage team covers the automotive world, the people who share your passion and mine, Smart, considered, rational, and experienced opinions. Ones you can learn from and grow. That includes our passion that drives auctions and the collector car market. So come with me and join us on this journey. And be sure to use the code CARS yeah when you subscribe and they'll give you $10 off. Boom! Linkage, geared for the automotive life. Subscribe today at LinkageMag.com. Here at Cars Yeah, it's all about inspiration. And our charity of choice is TechForce Foundation, where it's all about making a positive difference in young people's lives. TechForce helps young adults discover their talents and passions 
for all things automotive with a mission of helping students develop a career as a professional technician. TechForce awards nearly $2 million in scholarships every year for students to pursue technical education, and they support hands-on activities, events, and mentorships across the country, working to change the outdated perceptions of these careers. Auto techs are in high demand, but the supply of qualified technicians is critically short. They need your help to fuel their mission. Learn more and join me in supporting them at techforce.org. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah. Yeah.